Okay, thank you for tuning in to Stampscaping 101. This is just a uh, scene that I just finished. Um, I didn't even time it. I, I think it was about a 35 or 40 minute scene or something like that. Uh, fairly simple in composition. Um, let's see, probably used about one, two, three, four, five, six stamps on here. Didn't have to use them all, you know, but uh, uh, there's a lot of little elements that became a little bit more kind of obscured, you know, with the use of the toning in here. But the general idea of this one was I wanted to do a cool colored composition, something that was fairly um, shimmery, shimmering, I guess, in terms of light. I wanted some fog to be rolling into the scene, and uh, I wanted to have a, I wanted it to have a lot of texture with the use of the bleed proof white um, used in the uh, kind of all over the surface. I wanted it to look like kind of like an early snowfall, you know, with, you know, some wind coming in. So there's a little bit of a flurry. And you can see that texture kind of splattered about. And I thought it gave some real dimension, you know, into the different, you know, elements in the background here like that covered bridge I think looks really good with that little bit of a texture in the front of it. Kind of coming down here into these areas you can see what that uh, texture really brings into the uh, scene. Um, overall scene stamped, toned with the um, stylus tools just using, I don't know, the, the color scheme is pr fairly minimal because I didn't go very dark so I only used um, I don't know, maybe two or three colors, maybe maybe there was a fourth or something like that. But the one thing that I really like, enjoyed using to get um, a bit of that warmth into the scene and little areas on the pathway right in there were the Le Plume uh, permanent uh, markers. And the one that was really working for me was beige, just because it was so light. And I can color away over the top of the, um, the water-based pens without worrying about them smearing or blending away some tone that had already been laid down just simply for the fact that these are alcohol based and you know the dye based inks are water based so you can just color right over without worrying about that. Um, I thought about matting this off in something dark but I felt that this color of this I think the name of this paper is Brown Bag, and I thought that brought out the colors of the uh, the mill and the warmth of the, uh, you know, some areas of the trees and uh, road a little bit more, so. Um, anyways, a fairly fun scene to do. Um, I love little highlights, so, and textures, so this scene has a lot of uh, kind of my favorite little elements in it. Uh, down here in the road. Um, I used a lot of the uh, white gel pen as well, um, but you'll see that process um, if you choose to uh, watch the, uh, the video. Anyway, once again, thanks for tuning into uh, Stampscaping 101, and uh, I hope you enjoy the, uh, the video. Okay, in this scene we're going to try and create um, kind of an atmosphere that's very, it's kind of on the cooler side. I was thinking about having one really, really kind of icy cold feeling, but then I started thinking about a different scene that I kind of wanted to go in the direction of um, something that's fairly foggy and uh, maybe with some texture um, in terms of like maybe like a little snow flurry kind of happening, kind of not deep into winter, but um, you know, kind of on the onset of winter type of uh, thing. Um, I'm going to be stamping the covered bridge, and I'm going to try and stamp the image with Memento London Fog. I kind of tested it right here, and I was. I'm trying to figure out the color, um, not really so much the color, but the value of it. How dark is it going to be? And 
it's fairly light. I'm kind of wondering if that's going to be too light or I also have a, a Marvy gray, which might be, well, they're about the same. Memento seems to be a little bit different in terms of the hue. The Marvy seems to be a little bit more neutral. Memento, I just know it's a little bit thicker, so it, it doesn't set up quite as fast. And the Marvy sets up a little bit faster, so uh, with both things being somewhat equal in terms of the value, I think I'm going to go with the Marvy just so I don't have to wait for that memento to set up. I'm sure I'll be using the memento in the coloring process, but let's just go with the Marvy right here um, just to kind of expedite things for the purpose of this video. If I weren't, weren't shooting a video, I, I could stamp out that memento and, you know, um, it's not going to stay moist for a long time because I'd be stamping it on a dry piece of paper, so, you know, it'll set up fairly quickly, but uh, I will make it go even faster with the use of the uh, the Marvy. Um, not that you're watching this in sequence, you know, in terms of the other videos, but Marvy reinkers are still in production and uh, Marvy now sells just blank pads. Okay, they're not color coded like these ones. They're just a blank pad and nothing's on them. You can ink them up with whatever color you want and uh, you'll have that color. I don't know. You probably have to get a little of that ink on, you know, a piece of paper and stick it to it just so you know what color it is. But what's the good thing about it is we have inks. Uh, in terms of Marvy inks for the foreseeable future. I don't think they'll get discontinued, but uh, for right now, they're available. Okay, that was the covered bridge. This is um, my tack and peel um, block surface acrylic. You can put that tack and peel substance on one side, and you can always have a blank uh, acrylic block for your cling foam stamps on the other. You can always just stamp them out. But for bare rubber, tack and peel seems to be a good way to go. Okay, to fill out this kind of surrounding area right here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my um, tree cluster. There are other images you can use um, that would work just as good, but we'll go with the tree cluster for this one. Now, I think I'm going to make this into a little bit more of a foggy look, so I'm taking some of the ink off the bottom of this stamp so it'll stamp wet to dry and it'll thus be light to dark, okay? And I want the fog to kind of be lingering around, um, you know, towards the surface uh, to the base of the trees. So I wiped off that part, okay? I can say I had some green on that tree. Um, because I didn't clean it off, so, so be it. Okay, we'll do this again. I'll take off some of that ink off the bottom. I'm taking off a, a larger amount of it this time. Because I'm going, I want a tree right in this area. Okay, so I've wiped off this portion down here. You can see where it's wet and a little bit drier right here, okay? All right. Do the same thing again for this little spot here. And as you can see, I'm overlapping quite a bit. And there we have, um, so that tree cluster moving out like so, filling in that surrounding area. Okay, now let's see. I plan to do some things on the foreground, but I'm gonna wait 
until I stamp everything out and color it before I put this in. Sometimes I like to put my foreground in last in terms of the stamping and coloring process because I like to see how dark things get and uh, sometimes this works like a framing device and um, I want to know what to frame off meaning how dark does a certain area get where do I want some uh, you know foreground elements to kind of um, compositionally um, affect the overall scene. Okay, now let's add in some other um, textures and whatnot. I was going to use some of the sedge filler. I use that all the time, but I don't have that right here on my desk, so let's, let's fill it with something else. <laughs> It'll get me to do something different here, which is a good thing. Um, let's go with some of these. Um, this is called Tiny Rocks. Looks like I have some other color of ink on that as well, but let's see. This is this is using the Memento London Fog. Don't be afraid to use multiple impressions to get different um, values of that same stamp, especially when it comes to texture stamps. Okay, I have some tack and peel on this, by the way, as well. This is my, I think this is my smallest block that I use with the tack and peel. This is the Tiny Rock Small. Maybe I'll do some of the impressions of this in the background. Oops. Step that one upside down, no big deal. Does it really make a difference? Mm, not really, but in the that rock stamp, even on a really small thing, I put kind of put some larger rocks in the, for, in, in the front and it gets smaller in the back, so there's a little bit of depth within the stamp itself. Okay. And this is um, Snowy Twigs, is it? Let's do that in the Marvy gray. I'll tell you what, let's do, do something. Let's not stamp out that entire... I'm trying to get that to focus there. Try not to stamp... I'm not going to stamp out that entire uh, twig. I'm going to have some of the base kind of going into the ground a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is I'll just take a torn paper towel go with the torn side and just lay it down and use that twig right on the top of it. Kind of like that. So just a real simple composition right now. Um, hopefully it's blended together nicely. In terms of um, the imagery blends, now we're going to bring all of this together, introduce lighting, textures, etc. A little bit more hue maybe. Um, in the blending process, the color application process. Okay, now from my last video, um, I didn't really clean the tips off. Oh, it looks like I have a clean one right here. I was going to show you. What I usually do is I just usually, you know, wet a paper towel like this if I'm going to clean a tip. Okay. And, uh, you know, I just take, let's get that tip back on there. I just take this and I just dab it right on into there like that. You can also put them under the sink or something like that. And that works okay too. But you can see these tips here really hold quite a bit of ink, potentially. They're just like a 
stamp pad, you know, a small one on a wand. Okay, but let me get this clean one here. Okay, it's going to be a fairly simple color scheme. I stamped this out in gray, so it's not going to be able to get very dark. If I go darker than the actual impression, then of course the impression is going to start disappearing. So, let's go with some of that same color that it was stamped in. Actually, it was stamped in the Marvy gray. But I'm going to go on with the the Memento London Fog. I thought it was, you know, a, it was equally as, about the same hue, I guess. Uh, maybe slightly lighter, but the ink is a little bit thicker, so it's easy for me to blend it on the card and spread it around. Okay, now the general concept, you know, I like to frame off my scene, so... I'm going to um, kind of put a, a vignette of value around the scene. So let's go around on the perimeter. I mean, this is obviously our, you know, right, well, right now it's our focal point of the scene. You know, the eye is going to going to follow the road into that covered bridge. So I'm not going to want to make that bridge too dark. I, you know, I don't want to obscure it. It's kind of the focal point of the scene, and I want the eye to kind of go in there. So I'm probably going to retain, you know, a good portion of that road in terms of the light value of it uh, by not going over it with too much color. I might go over it with some of this light gray, because we're going to get darker, but... I won't go for it too much, okay? Now, the vertical sides of buildings, a lot of times I like to lay down a tone on them so it looks like the light is coming from above. Okay, now maybe for some of these trees in the background, I might put a some of this tone on those background trees, like so, just to kind of pop that rooftop out a little bit, okay? So here's some more tone on the side of the covered bridge. Put some on the inside as well. And hopefully by doing uh, this type of shading, what we're doing uh, when it comes to the covered bridge is trying to make it look a little bit more three-dimensional. You know, you're saying that, you know, much like a you know, a pad case like this, this is all the same color, right? But it's lighter on the top where the light is coming from, and you can see the sides are shaded. That's the same type of thing that I usually do with um, uh, things that represent three-dimensional shapes within scenes. I try to, you know, make them a little bit more um, dimensional through the use of shades. Now, I don't want this stark white, you know, that road, so I'm going to put some color over it, but I'm going to do so without shading everything out. Okay, a little bit of a stronger perimeter. Four corners. And I think I'm just about done with this uh, first color. I think it's coming together pretty good. Um, when you don't start off with black, um, kind of the lighting scheme kind of reveals itself in a more complete fashion. Um, with the use of lighter tones. When you go with black, you kind of have to work up to black, um, you know, for the shadows to kind of make the lighting scheme, um, I guess, make sense um, 
for lack of a better description. Um, okay, four corners now. That memento ink is really thick, like I said, so... Um, this gray is not penetrating the card very quickly, so it's really spreading around, which can be a good thing um, in terms of avoiding, you know, those big oval shapes like that, you know, in your card that can be removed as easily, okay? On the glossy card stock, with that thick ink down there, this color ink really just blends out very easy, okay? Or this, this value of ink, I should say. You don't want a dark oval shape, you know, sitting in the, the middle of your scene. So again, that's why I don't rush through the lighter tones. I, I spend the most amount of time with the lighter tones, even though <laughs> those tones, I mean, could potentially just um, be somewhat visually eradicated in terms of the, what you see on the surface um, with all the other colors that we use over the top of it. So, but even though that you can't really see that light gray of the London fog, over here, as you can right there, it's affecting that color over here too, so it's not a lost cause. These are transparent colors, and the layering process is being influenced by that London fog, okay? So again, the big thing that, uh, the big point is don't rush the, uh, don't rush the lightest of colors, they're the most important. Okay. We have gray, um, two shades of gray in the scene. It's looking fairly realized in terms of uh, the value scheme. Now, what I'm thinking about doing is I'm thinking about bringing in a little bit of extra temperature into the scene. I think it could potentially use it. Um, let's go with a little bit of blue. I know there's some green back there as well. Maybe something like this pale green might work. But let's go with the Adirondack Lights Aqua. Okay, That's not really ocean. Aqua, right? <laughs> that's, that's a much brighter blue that was in that tip. Okay, let me clean. this after all. Okay, let's get some of the ink off. I thought I got most of it out, but... No, you can, as you can see, there's a lot more in there. Um, probably past the surface, right, th right there. Okay. That's probably not perfectly clean, so the color that I get, or that I start applying onto the paper, might be some incarnation of whatever blue was in there, and aqua. Okay, now let's see. Yeah, I guess the camera can kind of pick that up a little bit. It's a little bit of that cooler tone. It looks like a number 10 Marvy um, light blue as well to me. That's a very bright blue color. In this scene, it looks okay, I guess. You know, having a bit of that temperature. To get a little bit up in that roof, uh, rooftop, um, the bridge roof. It, it's looking a little bit too stark white for me, so getting a little bit of a light shade of this in there. Okay, blue's coming out. It's coming out pretty good. I, I feel like the scene first hand right here, it, it looks a little bit 
kind of like more like it's glowing to me. Uh, that's the way I'd describe it. I guess because everything gets a little bit more full the more you add on to there. It's kind of a silvery look, I guess. Okay, now if we do want, you know, a little bit of temperature in there and something a little bit different, maybe we can go on with. Let me try something with this um, Marvy um, permanent. I guess brush marker, alcohol based brush marker. And let's see how that goes. Of course, with the brush markers, you can always go very light. Here's another one. Maybe I'll start off with this. It's a 821. It's an OR. I guess, I don't know, does that mean orange? I guess it might, because this one's an R, and that could be a red. I guess the color of this one's apricot. This one's uh, beige. I don't even know if I knew that they had the colors written on there and just until now. Uh, I can barely see what's happening uh, with this color. It's so light. I mean, I can tell. I don't know. I guess you can see, on the, I'm looking at my screen, you see how it's a little bit more warm than say right here? Well, that's why I've been adding it, so. Get a warm tone. That's kind of nice. Uh, the tone, not, the, not necessarily the squeakiness, but. Actually, that works out really good. I can just go right over that. I don't even have to worry about uh, it going on to the uh, um, mixing with the ink that's already been laid down because this is alcohol based and that's you know water based, so it's not smearing anything. And this is so light, man. That was perfect. It was, uh, and again, that was beige. What a color to start off with. I'm gonna use that one more often. Um, okay, now this one's the apricot. Let's try that. We'll go into the uh, the darker areas, I guess. It's subtle, though. I mean, it's not adding heavy shadows or anything like that, because it, it, it's really uh, light yeah, to begin with. Just a little bit darker than the beige. I like working from light to dark because if I add something dark, too dark, too fast, I, yeah, you know, sometimes you're kind of stuck with it. Let's see what this color is brownish gray. Ooh, that one's pretty dark. I have to be careful with this one, maybe. Adding it in some of the shadow areas. Underneath the eaves, I guess you can say. Uh, let me get that uh, lighter color out, and I'll kind of blend that out a little bit. Yeah, that was the, that was the, oh, that was camel. <laughs> no wonder it was darker. Let me, I shouldn't put that pen back. Where's that? This is pale green. Oh, where did that beige go? Yeah, here we go. Here's the beige. One thing about the alcohol inks, like I said, it's, uh, you know, they don't really mix with the other colors, so you can kind of take a, a lighter color and go back in and blend these darker colors out. And that's what I'm doing right here. Okay. Kind of, uh, Kind of muddy-ish, isn't it? Let's go on and add some highlights. It'll all come together. I, I'm planning on doing a, a splattering kind of over the entire thing. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but let's go and work on a little bit of lighting. Uh, let me lower this camera a little bit. See how it's all kind of moving into this muted 
look. Um, I mean, I kind of want that to an extent, but I want some life to still be in these areas. So, like right here, I'm kind of going in and redefining some of the rocks in here in terms of the lightness of them. I'm putting kind of a highlight on the top of them, so I'm giving them some dimension too. It's, when you do this, you're giving dimension in kind of some really detailed areas. Like that. And I think it brings things to life. There's a lot of rocks in this um, road area. So I'm going to bring some of that same texture in here. Um, maybe put some on the grass as well. Just anywhere where you see kind of the top surfaces of things. See that in there? That kind of brought back that a little bit in terms of the... Uh, oh... Uh, kind of life in terms of uh, value. I'm going in here too, I'm kind of adding some very large gel pen, just kind of ovals, kind of matching the, uh, the shapes of the um, tiny rocks stamp texture. back there is a really small little detail but um, and it's obscured of course in that kind of darkness and, it, and that's really hard to avoid when you're sponging so I don't I don't even try to avoid it but what I can do is I can come back in here with the gel pen and just color that little fence and kind of bring it back out a little bit dimensionally Here's some bricks on the, uh, you know, the supports of the uh, covered bridge you can do. So the trees in the background, you can put a few highlights on them. So I just want these little points of light uh, to be kind of sparkling about here and the, there. just to bring back a little bit of visual interest, a little bit of sparkle into an otherwise kind of muted um, kind of background. Okay, that's about right. Kind of coming in together now, huh? It's looking a little bit more Oh, I don't know what the word would be, kind of painterly, a lot of landscape painters and oils kind of, you work thin, uh, thin to thick, and the thicks are often like these little highlights um, in, the, uh, in the scene. Okay, now let's go in and add some fog. I'm going to do that now because um, I think it's a better time to do that than after we apply some of that opaque white, uh, bleed proof white that we're going to do. Oh, let's see. Oh, here's my pad right here. Oftentimes what I'm looking for is right in front of me. Uh, when it comes to my craft table, especially.
And if you're a stamper, you know what I'm talking about. We do one project in our, you know, we clean up our desk and everything like that, and everything's in order, then you do one project and it's all kind of, you know, in a pile again. Okay, let's add some fog at the base of things, like, you know, hovering around the road. I start off in the lighter areas, so I'm starting off in the lighter area of this road and working my way into, um, you know, the darker areas. So you see that kind of that kind of fog forming, that cloud. Uh, kind of obscuring some of that. It looks like that light is kind of coming from behind those trees in, in that section too. It doesn't have to be something based on realism of what you would see, but it could be something more along the lines of how someone might design a, a set for a movie or something like that. A lot of times when they're out in the forest or things like, you know, uh, animation, you'll see, you know, fog machines, you know, with this rolling fog in the background. It just looks more interesting, you know. Bands create those fog machines up on stage. You know, fog kind of captures the light, you know, in, in, in air. So you're kind of more aware of the, uh, I don't know, the kind of the space in between objects because light is able to capture, you know, if it's, the air is completely clear, you don't see it, you know, you just see the reflection of that light on a, you know, more of a solid object. So this is going in and adding that atmospheric touch, I guess you could say. And of course, wherever you add this, it's completely up to you. Um, I like to do it in the lighter areas again, and then I work into the darker areas. First of all, because when this is really wet, it's going to leave its strongest impression. I don't want big balls of paint in my dark areas, okay? So if I get big balls of paint in my lighter areas, it's not really gonna matter because you can't even see it. So what happens is the more you tap this, the drier it gets on there, and thus the lighter impression it leaves so that when I move into the those lighter areas or the, or the darker areas where you know light stands out more it's drier on here because I've tapped it out so much in the light so that's kind of the process when I'm working dark to light outside to inside and then I'm working light to dark inside to outside Just remember to leave some light somewhere. Just by simply not going over it too much, I, I guess you, you know, at least, if you want to do this. If the scene got too dark, you might be able to use like a, you know, a little bit of a, a gray pigment ink or something like that, as opposed to a white. Just so it doesn't stand out quite as much, if it looks odd. Kind of liking how this is going, um, just as is. The thing that kind of flashed before me in my uh, brain j just now was um, I wonder if I should do that bleed proof white on here. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna go for it and see. Okay, pigment ink, gel pen, white gel pen can be pretty effective at times. You can... Okay, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do here. I was thinking about. I was wondering if I wanted to use this. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Let's do it in the gray first. Uh, the Marvy Gray. Okay, the 
road kind of comes around this way, so maybe I'll put this like that. Okay, that looks pretty good, I guess. It's really wet here uh, with the impressions. I think when that dries off, they're gonna get a lot uh, lighter. I don't know, a lot lighter, but some. You can kind of see it right here. Uh, some of those impressions down there, let me see, are a little bit lighter anyways. Actually, that's the, uh, the winter twigs in the background there. But that's, that'll probably be about that light. And that, you know, what I'm saying is that these darker impressions are probably going to give out the same lightness as that. Because right now they're really wet because I've laid down so much ink underneath them that I, I stamp kind of wet into wet, so. Um, let's not wait for it to dry, though. Let's just go on with the show. I'm laying out some more of this paper because that bleed proof white and that splatter painting type of uh, technique can, you know, can get over everything kind of if you're not careful. And I don't do this so often that, you know, I feel like I'm in complete control of the process. Okay, Dr. Martin's bleed proof white, it's an opaque watercolor. In the last video, I mentioned that it was fairly dry in here, so I just reconstituted it with uh, some additional water, stirred it up, and it was kind of the, con the consistency of um, kind of like a really thick syrup. Okay, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get this on this brush right here, and I'm trying to get it, you know, down a little bit. I don't want so much on here, so I'm kind of wiping it off, and I'm trying to get it even. Oops. <laughs> even in the bristle, I got a big blob of it there. Okay. But no worries, I'm just going to take some of it off so I can get somewhat of controlled splatter. At least in terms of the direction. I don't know how controlled this is. But, uh. Try to get at least, uh. some minor control, you might say. By the way, this bottle's really old. It's probably like. I don't know, 25 years old. The, the packaging has probably changed, uh once or twice since then, so if it doesn't look like that, it, it's probably it if it's called uh, Dr. Martin's uh, Bleed Proof White. Okay, now I'm taking this, I'm going to, I'm probably about this distance from it, uh, six inches maybe, and I'm going to, what I'm doing is I'm pulling back on this toothbrush like this and of course as I do that it sprays that way so I'm kind of going for a finer spray than than thick can I, I start Flecking this a little bit more and more, the more kind of I realize where what direction I, I thought it was going to shoot out, you know, straight. But it, when I do this, it's kind of going backwards a little bit. So, but this is what it kind of looks like right now. See, so you can tell the difference from that in the bottom, right? I don't know. It it kind of looks like a little bit of a snowy texture or something like that. But all that 
what that white does up there too is it creates contrast. So everything was a little bit muted, right? Because it was light to begin with, and then I went over it with a bunch of colors. So it's kind of going with that theme too. It's just kind of putting an overall texture over things and uh, um, this big blob came out of the, uh, the brush. I guess be careful about that. I don't want a big blob on your scene probably. Um, uh, what was I talking about? It's just it's adding that texture in there and uh, The very dot size that I'm getting to is okay. I think it actually adds to the uh, the overall kind of overall feel, I guess you can say, of the piece. Okay, uh, I don't want to go overboard, maybe I did, but this is what your thumb looks like after doing that. Um, but this is the scene right here. It's kind of like <laughs> the first snowfall, it's kind of coming down, that's getting thicker and thicker. It's kind of obscured what's going on in the scene in many ways. But you can still kind of see it. I'm, you know, I have this really close and showing a close up of the texturing. But, you know, I mean, when you hold it at an arm's distance, you can kind of tell, you know, what the composition is in terms of the trees a little bit more. Why not? Okay, so that is the scene. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to spray this and the impression should get a little bit darker uh, when you do that. And then I get that little bow out, little glare you can kind of see. Okay, um, I'll spray this and then it should get a little bit darker. It might dry too and get a little bit lighter, so I'll do both and I'll start the video up again and uh, we'll take a look and see what it looks like at that time. I'll let it dry a little bit too, I think. Not too long because they don't really need to, but uh, oh, let's see how this looks, okay. Okay, I don't know if this is showing it or not, you know, from that little cut there, but I think it got a little bit darker in the darker areas with that um, spraying of the uh, uh, acrylic art spray. I used a Krylon uh, UV um, clear. Um, yeah, I, I think it got a little bit darker. So, that being said, that is the finished scene. Kind of my room's being filled with fumes right now from that acrylic spray. It's like a, you know, uh, smelly spray, but uh, it'll go away. And uh, usually I let it fume a little bit more uh, and dry before I kind of bring it back in. But for the sake of this video, I wanted to show you what it looked like has a little bit of a, kind of a satiny finish you can see with that gl glare in there and especially with all this texture one of the things that's cool about this um, bleed proof white too is it does give it you know kind of a three-dimensional feel uh, when you finish the scene and I already have plans I you know I'm gonna give it a little bit of a I don't know the treatment that I 
do on most of my scenes. I give a, a little bit of a, a, a border in terms of matting. I'll probably do a really light blue. It'll be somewhat about that. That star dream blue is roughly about that, you know, value. And then I'll probably put it on a, a card, maybe a black or dark blue card or something like that, navy blue. And that should uh, kind of finish this off as a, as a finished piece. So I don't. I, I like. I like how this came out. It, the colors are really, really muted, but I think they're still reasonably uh, rich in terms of the uh, color scheme. We have our lights and darks in here. The darks aren't too dark, but uh, they move up into probably an eighty percent grayscale or so. But just the fact that there's some warms and cools as far as temperature changes like that in here, fairly subtle. But um, that beige um, was a really great color uh, to work with uh, in terms of the uh, alcohol um, pen. Uh, I need to use that more often, I guess. But um, as far as a textural statement, really fun to do that splatter painting and see what comes out. And uh, I don't know, overall it has kind of a nice, I don't know, like a patina or whatnot, and some of it a painterly quality, you know, with all the imagery not quite so distinct just for the fact that it was um, stamped out in a lighter color and then all the tones were blended in over the top of it. So, um, I don't know, it's a little bit of a departure for me, but um, I don't know, we need to do that every now and then, or at least I do. I don't want to get caught into somewhat of a formula um, in terms of my color compositions and uh, um, textures that I do. So anyways, hope you enjoyed the scene and uh, thanks for uh, watching.